potluck in the other room and we've got good fellowship. We on? Okay, excellent. Let's bow in prayer one more time. Father, as we sang today already, glorious truths from the pages of your word. Father, as we've looked into the Bible today already, as we think about how you are holy, 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 and all that that means as one of your attributes. Father, our hearts overflow with thanksgiving that you are such a good God and such a powerful God. Today, I pray that as we look at prayer, that we would go to school in terms of learning what Jesus taught. And Father, many of us have heard the passage that we're going to look at today, and yet we could always be refreshed and reminded. And the truth of Scripture is so fathomless that it will impact us time and time again, as long and as many times as we read it. And so we ask today that you would minister to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you, and we bow in submission to what your word says today. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, part 58. Uh, Whatever part we're on, we're going to continue to enjoy our time in the Sermon on the Mount together because the Lord's teaching is so beautiful and so eloquent. But it's not limited to that. This isn't merely a good sermon. This isn't merely a a, a brilliant uh, discourse. This is heavenly truth. And it's spoken in the context of a time when so much about God's Word had been abused and was just in complete disrepair. The Pharisees had made a mockery of the truth of God's law. They had introduced all kinds of extraneous teachings, unnecessary things that they made up, and then they elevated their rules up to the level of Scripture so that the average person was being led by a bunch of hypocrites. And when the blind lead the blind, what happens? They all fall into the ditch together. And Jesus is looking out and he has compassion on the multitudes that are gathered on that hillside that day. And so he begins to teach them and he just says, listen, I'm going to set this straight for you. And I'm so glad he did, aren't you? As we read these instructions about how we ought to conduct ourselves before God, what we ought to believe about our Father. It's so much richer than any man-made religion. I love it. It's just, you see the shoddiness and the cheapness of the Pharisee hypocrisy as Jesus shines the light on what they've done. So remember, most of the Sermon on the Mount here is a corrective over and against what the Pharisees had done with God's law. Jesus is restoring it to its proper authority. And we're so thankful he did that in such clear terms. Well, we're in that portion of the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to look, starting in verse 1 of chapter 6, I'm going to read as a recap what we looked at last week. There's three things in chapter 6 that are being addressed here. Uh, Actually, four things. But the three things that we're beginning with is giving to the poor prayer, and fasting. We're taking each of those in sequence. Today we'll be on the prayer portion, but last week we looked closer at this truth. Look at verse 1 of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The word reward there being missed on in the Greek It's something given to somebody because they earned it. We don't earn our salvation, but we work as an overflow of gratitude. And in pursuit of one day, we will be rewarded in heaven in a beautiful and awesome way. Folks, you want these rewards. You want the misthon that comes from your Father in heaven. He sees your deeds. He's the one that we ought to understand that we are ministering to first and foremost. But he says here, you have no reward if you're practicing your righteousness to be noticed by men. This is the overarching context of of what has become to be chapter 6 in our scriptures. If you're doing righteousness 
so that other people will notice you and applaud you and pat you on the back and give you credit for your goodness or your performance, well, then, my friend, you are on your way to being a professional Pharisee. And that is something we want to avoid at all costs. So Jesus begins on this idea of almsgiving or charity, giving to the poor, something, by the way, that we ought to do, that we must do as believers. He doesn't say if you give to the poor. He says in verse 2, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. And I've been asked by request to do my trumpet sound. Can I do it this morning? Forget it. Uh, I'm not here to perform in front of you folks, my righteousness. No. No. But understand the imagery here. Once again, historically, we don't have any real record of somebody who went, I'm giving now. There you, are, you got it, shofar. But that's the picture here, and this was a euphemism that, that talked about a person who wants to be noticed. And it's so clear in its conveyance, is it not? The trumpet sounding before you in the synagogue or in the streets. Jesus says, don't give to the poor like that so that they may be honored by men so that the person giving that might be honored. Jesus says, truly, and every time we see truly in our English translation, we ought to think amen. Amen, he says, I say to you, they have their reward in full. You can take that to the bank, he says. If you're a Pharisee, you're a hypocrite, you're a person who wants your righteousness noticed and recognized as an audience of humans, he says, then that's like sounding a trumpet when you do it. Which to me is altogether ludicrous and ridiculous if that was something we actually did. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? Verse 3, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, crypto in the Greek, and your father who sees what is done cryptically or in secret will reward you. Some of your Bibles may add the word openly. The idea will be that the rewards that come from the father someday are going to be something that all of us are going to be so happy that we received because we did things faithfully. Amen? Isn't that what Jesus is really exhorting them to do? Stop your performance Stop trying to get other people to give you credit for those things that you're doing allegedly for God. We're going to see that this is primarily a heart issue, is it not? Yes, it may show itself in fruits and in works, but if it comes from a heart of pride, what does it want? It wants credit. It wants the worship, the glory being given to a human being. Now, all of us like to be recognized for our service. Isn't that right? I mean, honestly, right? Can I get some nods? Can I get an amen? Yes, of course. We love the way it sounds. We love when somebody says, thank you. We love when somebody says, I just want to let you know, you're a blessing around here. We love that. And we try to do that. We encourage one another. But let's not make the mistake this morning. Let's realize there ain't nothing good about any of us except Jesus. That's the facts. You wouldn't be able to draw your next breath were it not for the grace and mercy of a holy God who said, I'm making provision so that I don't wipe you out in my wrath. Because you're sinful and you're worthy of death. But Jesus, Jesus came and died in our place. And we are now clothed with His righteousness. And we have been created to walk in the Spirit and produce good works with the strength and the empowerment that God gives us. And we ought to be having those evidences in our lives. But you know what? Don't do it to be noticed by men. Don't give so that other people will look and go, oh, look how much he gave. Ooh. You only give what God gave you first. Amen? Think about it. We could see where the humility is supposed to be here. Well, let's talk about the next subject. We've talked about giving to the poor. Well, Jesus wants to correct and wants to instruct and wants to exhort his true disciples on the proper way to pray. My friends, if there's something so vital and essential to your Christian life, it is prayer. It is time spent in prayer. It is the heart, the attitude of prayer. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And none of us can really do that on a perfect level. Amen? But do we understand the attitude that's, that's being exhorted there from the Scriptures? To pray without ceasing means to be in an attitude, to cultivate 
a divine habit of communicating with God. After all, what is prayer? It is talking with our God. It is sharing with our Creator. He already knows all things, but He likes us to communicate with Him. In fact, and we don't have time to go into this, but all the way back in Eden, we've been created in the image and the likeness of God. We have been created for a relationship with our Creator. Isn't that wonderful? And if you have that, it's only because you've trusted in Jesus Christ. He's the means by which you enter into this wonderful relationship with the Father. And then we are to be people of prayer. I want to encourage you this morning, if you struggle in your time of prayer, maybe you're overthinking it. Maybe you ought to naturally just call out to God at any moment of any day at any time and say, Lord, help me be grateful. Help me understand what it is to know you. And you will find that you have been created for that relationship. You will find yourself calling out to God. And it may look a little different among all of us. Some of us are gifted prayers in the sense that it just comes natural. Some of us struggle to focus. Some of us do various postures and when we go into times of prayer. Others of us just sit here and try to talk to God all day. Which one are you? Think about it. That component must be present, though, in a true believer. In a true disciple, you must pray. Jesus is not going to say, if you pray. He's once again going to say, when you pray. And my challenge will be to you, look at the when of your prayer life right now and ask yourself, are you doing well in this area? Please understand, I don't want to overthink it. It is talking to your God. If you know Him and you claim to love Him and worship Him, then He should be as approachable as a heavenly Father, as Abba. Think about that for a moment. The God of the universe wants you to talk to Him and He has created you with the capacity to do that. You are in His image and His likeness. You are able to worship Him and we are able to come to Him in prayer. How important is prayer? I'm just going to read you a few stats from the Scriptures. Listen to this very quickly. 650 prayers are mentioned in the Bible. Now this also counts some of the Scriptures about praying and about requests being made known to God, things of that nature. There are 450 or so recorded answers to prayers as we see in the 66 books of Scripture. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 13 and 4, 9, if you're going to count those two as the time where God initiates a dialogue with Adam and Eve, you will know without even having to go there that it is right after the fruit was eaten and judgment was being meted out. But God is walking in Eden in the the cool of the day, and he calls out to Adam. And this is the first, you know, type of interchange where we have a dialogue with God. Adam, what have you done? Oh, well, you know. And then he blames his wife, right? That's how that all works. And then she blames the serpent. But listen, there was a dialogue there, and and we have every reason to believe that that was a normal part of their existence in Eden, that they had frequent times of communion with God. Genesis 4, 26, you don't need to turn there either, but after Seth was born, it says, Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And I love that verse because that sort of institutes a beginning of a a practice that although already present, it was notable in its frequency and its scope. Then, in those days, after the birth of Seth, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It's this idea that we're coming before our Creator and we're bringing our needs to Him. We're bringing praise and thanksgiving. Jesus was mentioned to have been praying 25 times in the Gospels. We know sometimes it was in solitude. He'd go off to a mountain to pray and to get refreshed and renewed and have private one-on-one time with his Father. A couple times they were public prayers, John 17 being one of them, in the presence of his disciples. Other times he lifts his eyes towards heaven and talks to his heavenly Father. Jesus, Jesus' ministry and life was marked by prayer to God. Paul mentions something about prayer 41 times in his letters. 
Are we getting the picture? Is the scripture clear that we ought to be people of prayer and it even tells us how to do it? Five specific postures are mentioned throughout the Bible. Sitting, standing, kneeling, your face on the ground, or lifted hands. How many of you think that God has a variety of ways that He says, listen, your posture is secondary to the fact that you're doing it. I would like to encourage all of you not to fold your hands and close your eyes while driving. Because that's not a safe way to pray to God. But nonetheless... Driving, for me, is in two hands. One, as you all know, the most frustrating times of my existence. The biggest struggle I have with anger. So guess what? I'm actually praying quite a bit when I drive. But it's also a time where if I'm coming between meetings during the week, if I'm going to meet somebody or to visit somebody, every drive there is a time for me to talk to God. And that for me works. I, I cultivate that time. I'm trying to pray without ceasing, which again, doesn't work all the time with my life. And then there are other times where I need times of just special refreshing prayer. Times of privacy with God and I. And then of course I love praying with you folks. Nine types of prayer specifically mentioned in the Bible. And again, this is a, just a partial list. We won't even go to the verses. I just want to remind you that there are scriptures about prayers of faith, prayers of agreement, a corporate prayer, prayers of requests, be, you know, telling God what we need, asking Him for what we want at times, prayers of thanksgiving, just pure worship prayers where we're just thanking God for His attributes and praising Him with holy hands lifted. Prayers of dedication, prayers of intercession, as many of us are praying for other people that need to know Jesus or need healing. It's a beautiful privilege. Prayers of imprecation, prayers of cursing upon the enemies of God. Those are in there too. 1 Corinthians 14 tells us about praying in the Spirit. We will be looking at that concept at a power to stand next month. And it's a very interesting one. We know that the Holy Spirit helps us pray when we don't know how to pray. How many of you have many times in your life where you just don't even know the first word to say to God? And he goes, that's okay. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. He utters groanings that cannot be uttered. Amen? He tells us, he prays and helps us pray as we ought to pray. I mean, God is so fixated on the fact that we need to be prayer warriors and prayerful people that He, with His Holy Spirit dwelling in us, enables us to pray when we cannot. And there are many times where I cannot. Isn't that great? What does all this tell us? It tells us that God loves us and He wants communication with us. He wants us to bring these things to Him. His, our burdens and, and our, our confessions of our sins. Numbers 5.22 is the first mention of the word Amen. 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 Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says this over and over. Amen, amen. I'm telling you. This is, so let it be. Or we agree together. That's what amen means. We agree with what has been prayed or what God's Word says. I find myself saying amen a lot. And I'll, oftentimes I'll say that to you folks as we're preaching, right? Amen. Say amen with me. Why? Because it, it's a beautiful word. And it just finalizes our resolve to accept the truth that we say amen to. Isn't that beautiful? God's given us a word for that. It's so cool. Well, let's get back to Matthew chapter 6 for the rest of our time this morning. I'm going to read about the problem, the first problem. In verses 5 through 15, we have what I would like to entitle this morning, the power of private prayer. Private prayer. It's not wrong to pray publicly. We do that. It's a wonderful thing as corporately with God's people as we pray together. And I want to remind you once again, when we sing these hymns, when you sing a praise chorus to God, when we read Scripture up here, oftentimes these are couched in terminology of prayer. We're singing it to God. So I want to remind you, even as you sing these words, don't let it be commonplace and ritualistic for you. Think about every lyric that we utter in this room. Think about it. 
because you are speaking it to God. At least you should be primarily. Wow. Heavy stuff. But let's look at prohibited prayer number one. Did you know there are types of prayer that God detests? Can I be honest with you? Types of prayer that actually hurt his ears, if you will. Types of prayer that he looks down and goes, "Hmm, no, not answering that. Types of prayer where God is moved to anger when they are offered. Can you imagine? Well, look at this. Jesus wants to correct this for people. Why? Because the Pharisees were doing a really bang-up job of hypocritically, pridefully, arrogantly, foolishly to themselves praying for the performance so that other people would go, what great prayers you are. Do you know a great prayer? Do you? Be careful about complimenting them. Because the greatest prayers aren't praying so that you will recognize their greatness. Amen? Think about this for a minute as we read this. Look at verses, uh, I want to do 5 through 6. We'll just look at that in Matthew chapter five, uh, 6. Jesus says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. Why? For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. That should should bring foulness in us when we read that. Ew, that's creepy. That's gross. Truly, amen, I say to you that they have their reward in full. But you, he says, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, we're going to get to this in a moment. And I want to reemphasize as we begin that public prayer is not a sin. Praying out loud is not a sin. What's the sin? It's the heart intent if you're doing it so that other people will hear you pray. Maybe you've been in a prayer meeting where that's happened or you knew that was happening. Can I, can I say this, how we have to be careful? And I do this. I, I struggle with this, so I'm not saying this in any self-righteous way. Well, we have to be careful how we preach to other people when we pray publicly. Anybody ever done that, where we go into Bible studies while we're praying to God? We're telling God, well, you know, it says in Ecclesiastes that you... And then we just, like, lay that out. Are we, are we telling God that, you know, or are we telling other people? We, have to, we just have to guard against it. I've shared with you when pastors get together to pray... It can oftentimes be a very interesting exercise in restraint because we're trying, you know, you want to pray with that man of God next to you, and then there's this thing that creeps in. I'm just confessing to you this morning. You want to pray a good prayer. You don't want to be the guy standing there going, Oh, dear Lord, we thank you again. And, you know, what do we do? We, um, thank you, uh, and Lord, and Father, and we say Father 50 times, and we try to do this, or we try to get eloquent with our prayers. I shared with you once, I worked with some Calvary Chapel guys, and we started doing this prayer thing together, uh, you know, once or twice a, a month, and we would get together, and we would pray these prayers, and the guy next to me, he would pray this prayer, and then and the other pastors would go, mm, mm, while he's praying. Lord, we thank you for the, mm, Mm. Mm. And then I'm sitting there like, mm. you know, I'm like, should I, you know, is this? And then somebody would pray something and it would just be, oh, thank you, Je- oh, thank you, Jesus. And then, I, but if I wasn't careful, and this happened to me many times, I began just li- like, I couldn't tell you what was being prayed. I'm just sitting here listening to the mm's and the uh, you know, these things and the amens. And, and then it comes my turn. And if I didn't get mm's or ums while I'm praying, There was this thing in me going, maybe my prayer wasn't that good, but maybe I'm not praying in the Spirit. Maybe I'm not really, maybe I don't have the power of God because it didn't make Pastor Al go, hmm. It's the stupidest thing, and I'm glad you're chuckling because you're going, what an idiot, and you're thinking of me. But that that is how this thing works, man. That is how this sneaking thing happens. And before long, you're a hypocrite. Before long, you're more worried about getting the mmms from your fellow pastor than you are about what you're saying to God. And then you start tailoring what you say in order to get the mmms and the amens. Oh, you don't feel any better than when you leave a prayer meeting and they went mm more than they did during your prayer than anybody else, including pastors with bigger churches. Do you see what I'm saying? 
It's evil, it's sick, it's rank, it's gross. God's not up there going, well, I, you, know, you only got four amens during your prayer. <laughs> He's not doing that. But we do it. Jesus says, when you pray. He says, don't pray like the hypocrites. Jews prayed three times a day, ritually. Okay, morning, noon, and night type of thing. The ninth hour, the late, it was actually early morning, late afternoon, and the evening. And in the Psalms, you will read morning prayer for guidance, evening prayer. We love those. It's beautiful. It's wonderful as long as it doesn't become a ritual. Acts 3.1 says that Peter and John went to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer, which it mentions there is the ninth hour. So there were times that were designated to pray. And at times, that was public. You're praying corporately with others. They hear you pray. So the idea is, when you pray, Jesus says, it's not wrong. We, we can deduce by the fact that Jesus did it publicly and the others did it publicly. John 17, I already mentioned, Jesus' high priestly prayer was done uh, among his disciples. Let me read these to you for those of you taking notes, but they will be on the notes page on the YouTube. Acts 114, Acts 124, Acts 815, Acts 1625, and Acts 2036. The apostles and those in the early church prayed corporately, publicly, and out loud. Not a problem. Amen? What's the problem? If you pray like a hypocrite. If you pray like a hypocrite. Go with me to Luke chapter 18 for a moment. Luke 18. We will get here someday as well, but we know, we know this account. Look at verse 9. We'll read it quickly because our time is fleeing away from us. Precious Lord and Savior saying, he says, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. This is what we're talking about. There's the heart attitude. Here's the parable. Jesus says in verse 10 of Luke 18, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Wow, two stinkers. Okay, <laughs> two bad guys. Two of them. The Pharisee stood, verse 11, and was praying this, how? To himself. Wow, think about that for a minute. If God were to show you a printout of the times that your prayers actually never made it past the ceiling because they were to you or to other people, what would it look like? The Pharisee prayed to himself and he stood. And the idea here is a public standing. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Have you prayed this lately? Yes, you have. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, he says piously. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, and he was saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Boy, is that true or is that true? Amen? You know what he was saying? One of these guys is not praying to the Father at all. The most unlikely candidate in terms of scores of righteousness was the one who had the penitent heart and recognized his sinfulness before God. My friends, you want justification. You need justification Meaning this, not from men, but from God. Because justification scripturally is God declaring you righteous by acknowledging that you have repented and believed on the gospel and have been given, imputed, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is not your righteousness that is in view here. It is God declaring you legally and spiritually righteous because of what Jesus did and Jesus' righteousness. If you don't have that put into your spiritual account, my friends, you are praying to yourself or something else. You do not belong to God. 
So there's my presentation of the gospel for anybody watching later this week. You need to be declared righteous by God. And there's only one means that that can happen. That is by believing and receiving what Jesus Christ did in your place on the cross at Calvary. He bore your sins and iniquities. He took the wrath of God against the sin that damns you. He took it. He took the heat and paid the price. And yelled, it is finished on the cross. Amen? He was buried. He rose again from the dead, proving that he has victory over death and sin and the devil. And he's coming again to take his own. You don't have him. You ain't got nothing. You can pray all you want. You can yell things. You can say phrases. You can repeat mantras. You can do whatever you think you want to do. And it won't get you any closer to salvation. You need justification. And Jesus said in the parable, this man was justified because he recognized he was the sinner. Heavy. You better recognize and come to Christ. He says... Let's go back to Matthew 6. He says, you've got to realize, if you're praying like a hypocrite, you're praying for other people to hear you, you're not praying crypto or in secret, then you have your reward in full. That's what you get, baby. Oh, what a good prayer. Oh, that was amazing. What a discourse. Wow, this guy, rap guy. Hey, there it is. There's your reward. Take that to the bank. How do you like that one? You know why that doesn't work? Because the next time you've got to top that. It's addictive. The praise of men. The acknowledgement of other people. It's an addiction. You've got to keep doing it. This is the philosophy of the seeker-driven church model, by the way. You've got to entertain the heck out of people and then you've got to do it better every week or what happens? You lose the momentum, therefore you lose the rear ends in your seats. That's how it happens. Why? Because it's a man-based performance. You're not being rewarded by God. That's the rewards that nobody will see here on the earth, but one day you'll be so glad that God noticed. Isn't that beautiful? Man. Verse 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your inner room. Literally in the Greek, the room of you, the tamion. Sometimes it's used as a barn. Luke 12, 24 says, the birds have no tamion, have no barns to dwell in. It's a store chamber. It's a secret chamber. It's a closet. It's an inner room, as your Bible might say. Isaiah 26.20 brings to the Jewish people this end times feel where he says to the people, he says, go into your inner rooms for a little while until the indignation is past. The protection from the judgment of the tribulation. Go into your inner rooms. Matthew 24.26, Jesus warns that in the last days, people might come to you in the false Christs and say, look, he's come back. He's here or He's there. He's in the desert or the secret chamber, the tamion, the inner rooms. And Jesus says, don't believe Him. Don't go in there. I'm only coming back one way and that's publicly. You see, it's the opposite of the public eye. Luke 12, 3, Jesus says that what's whispered in the tamion, the secret chambers, will be proclaimed from the rooftops. God sees, God knows, and He's going to air it all out, baby. Amen? I don't know why I keep saying baby this morning. (laughs) I don't know what it is. But can we understand what Jesus says here very clearly? When you pray, He says, go into your closet. Go into your inner room. Close your door, He says. And then pray to your Father who is in crypto. He's secret. It's you and God. My friends, that's precious. Why? You're not performing for anybody. If you do it in private, you don't have to worry about what people think and you definitely don't have to sit there and listen for the mm, uh, mm. It's you and God. And it's a wonderful private time of communion. Friends, I do this in the car. My secret room is in my car because I don't talk to anybody. I don't answer my phone when I'm driving, usually. And what happens? It's me and God right there. It's me and God. Then I get up in the morning and I have my coffee. And I heard this wonderful thing. I love my coffee as much as I love the sound of nobody talking to me while I drink it. 
That's brilliant, man. I read. I love that. That's my time. That's my beginning time. I have my cup of coffee and I sit in my living room and look at the morning light. That's what I do. And I talk to God. And I look out and I go, thank you, God. And then it just flows. Communion flows. Other times we have to seek a place, a walk in the woods or something. And let me tell you, the spiritual formation movement, the contemplative mystics have messed this all up for a lot of people. Solitude, man, the discipline. You got to do that and you got to empty your mind, bro. And you got to go do this thing and don't do that. And I mean, no, it's not this I'm logging hours with God. It's not this, oh, look at the piety here of this guy. No, listen, Jesus modeled for us a time to get away so that you're away from distraction. And by that, I don't mind. I, I'm not against solitude, being alone, because you're not really alone. You're with God, and you need to take that opportunity to commune with Him without the craziness of the day. I get it. I just don't want to make it into some rigid, Benedictine way of life, monastic type mysticism that comes into it. You don't do it so that you have a mystical experience with God. You do it because you belong to Him. And you have the Holy Spirit guiding and directing you in prayer in those hours. It's good stuff. Maybe some of you need to get away and get to where the distractions are minimal. And you can sit and really have some chat time with the Lord. It's good. It's refreshing. It's wonderful. Jesus says, go and do it privately. That's the point here. Close your door. Put the, turn the phone off, right? And your Father, who sees what is done in crypto, will reward you. And again, the implication here is in an open way. My friends, that's the miston. That's the reward that you want. Prohibited prayer number one is public performance prayer. That stinks when anybody does it, if it's being done with the motives of the hypocrite. Prohibited prayer number two. Did you know there was a second one? Let's look at verses 7 through 8. This one kind of gets my goat a little bit. And I've dealt with a lot of issues with this. And I love that this passage is in here. Prohibited prayer number two. The pagan prayer. The pagan prayer. And yes, it is possible for Christians who belong to Jesus to fall into a habitual ritualistic recitation for prayer. I'll give you two examples of pagan prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed are thee and blessed are the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, dot, 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 dot. And I have to say it 28 more times and I'm absolved. That's what I do. Or, very similarly, in India, and I can't speak Sanskrit so I can't say it, but there's prayers to Krishna with beads. The Buddhists do it with beads and they, they go each bead just like the rosary and they just wrote recitation of a formula allegedly to God or a God. We've seen the pagans do this. This is what they do. And Jesus says, when you pray, when you are praying, verse 7, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles, the ethnic koi, in the Greek, the pagan, the heathen, synonymous with Gentile or non-Jew, a non-covenant person, uh, referencing the goyim, all the other nations. This is how they pray. He says you're not to do meaningless repetition. Your Bible might say vain repetition. Useless, formulaic, ritualistic phraseology over and over and over again. Eastern meditation calls it a mantra. It is a habitual ritual phrase that you say over and over again because if you say something enough times, it short circuits linear thinking. Well, who gave you linear thinking? Who gave you logic? Who gave you a brain? God did. And it is meant to work in concert with the heart. You are to love your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If any one of those components are somewhere else, then you're not fully loving and worshiping God in the right way. Can I be really honest this morning? The hyper-charismatic friends that we may all have, maybe you don't have any, but all you need to do is turn on TBN, you'll see them. The incessant, ecstatic utterance 
called the gift of tongues today by many in charismatic and Pentecostal circles. You've seen it. It's gibberish, mostly. It's being done all at once in total opposition to what Paul's command said in the Scriptures to the Corinthians. It's not a true earthly language, therefore it cannot truly have an an interpretation. So it's not the gift of languages that God's Holy Spirit gives. I will be teaching on this next month in the Power to Stand class about the gift of tongues, what it is and definitely what it isn't. But meaningless, vain repetition, whether a mantra, which is that word that's designed to short-circuit your logic thinking so that you can have a spiritual experience, uh, uh, you know, i.e. Buddhism, Hinduism, the meditation on the chakras, yoga. It's all part of it. It's all a completely mystical worldview that gets you in touch with demonic powers in the guise of you having some sort of a divine self. It's the ultimate self-centered, turning inward, trusting on your own capacities to do it. And a mantra helps you do this. Meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, Jesus says. Why are they not supposed to do it? Why are true believers not supposed to do it? It says, well, what's the reason the Gentiles do it? For it says in verse 7, they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Ooh, can I touch a hard issue here for a moment? Oof. We have to be careful as believers in our public praying not to be overly wordy. Because not only does it begin to look like a performance to others sometimes, but it runs the risk of you thinking that if I'm eloquent enough, God will hear me. You understand the subtle risk that I'm referencing here? I've said this silly illustration before, but it really illustrates this, and I'll be really quick. The young Scottish preacher stands in the pulpit near Glasgow and says, let's open in prayer. Now, I'm not going to do the rest of it in the Scottish accent, but he starts and he goes, he goes, oh, great Almighty Heavenly Father, whose attributes are more than the raindrops and the sands of the sea and the da da da, and he goes on this thing, and whose angels beckon thee to da 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 da, and he's launching into this wordy prayer, and the old woman in the front row goes, just call him Father and ask him for something. <laughs> and I love that story. I don't even know if that's true, but that's funny. But she, what's she doing? She's stopping the, the words, the abundance of words that some people like to put in. Now, I'm not, I'm, I am not against... Ooh, gosh, I don't want to get in trouble if you're a long prayer. If you're a super long prayer, and I've been that, I've been that publicly even, we have to be careful of it. We have to be careful that we're not thinking in our hearts that I'm logging time with God in a special reward type way because of the length of my prayer so there's really two things aspect here that the pagans do many and abundant words and long prayers that include or maybe or maybe not meaningless repetition there's what i want to really focus on as the main problem here but it's all a risk for us when we do this see now i'll have to keep all my prayers short in front of you because i've said this do you know what I mean? What's he addressing here? The heart. He's addressing the heart. Don't need to turn there, but 1 Kings 18.26, what did the pagans do? What did the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth do on Mount Carmel all day? They cried out to Baal to answer them by fire. You can read this miracle on your own where the true God does that for Elijah, but... The prophets of Baal jumped all over the place, cut themselves, the blood's flowing freely. It was a mess. And they're screaming out to Baal, and of course Baal doesn't answer. There's the tragedy, right? But what did they do? That's how the pagans do it. That's how the nations do it. Prayer that doesn't just include uh, over and over re re repetition and everything, but also what? Mutilation in the terms of some circles. But this is what the pagans do. Polylogia, using many words with the intent to be heard. And we need to be careful to avoid pretension, wordiness, and some sort of mystical ritual where we're just babbling in vain repetition. Prohibited prayer number one is public performance prayer. Prohibited prayer number two is pagan praying. 
And Jesus says both are wrong. Don't be guilty of this because the Pharisees were into it. Let's end in verse 8. We're actually going to end in Ecclesiastes 5 too, but verse 8 says, So do not be like them. That would include the hypocrites mentioned before and the pagans mentioned after. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. There's the remedy. If our theology includes the fact that God knows everything that we're going to ever pray to Him, ever, then perhaps we should work on conciseness a bit. I'm just going to say it that way. I have been in prayer before a crusade or something where quite a bit of time was spent praying for the filaments in the light bulbs of the stadium so that they would not burn out during that evening's thing. I guess that's okay. That's pretty detailed. But I've been also in prayers where we attempted to pray all night. Have you ever been in a lock-in prayer when you were in youth group or something? So about the sixth hour, all right, I'm praying for Taco Bell or some other, you know, I'm praying, I've, I've run out of, you know what I mean? But do you understand, even we, we have to just guard, I, that's, that's all stupid, don't ignore all that. But we have to just guard against these things. Because we want to be proper prayers to the Father. By all means, pray. And I have a friend who started a t-shirt company called Never Stop Praying. And I love that because it always reminds me never to stop praying. And there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And the premise of our prayers, Jesus says, is that God knows what you need already before you ask Him. Does that bring you comfort today? He knows the requests that you're going to have next week that you don't even know are looming on your horizon. He knows what's going to happen to you. He knows what kind of trials He's going to walk you through. And as He's walking you through the ones He has now, your Heavenly Father knows what your needs are. He knows what your desires are and your wants are. He knows the things we need to confess to Him. He knows the things and the times where He just knows that we need to thank Him and rest in His blessings. He knows when you need to get away and He knows when you need to pray publicly for people. He knows, He knows, He knows, and He rewards because He sees and He loves to hear from His children. Amen? Isn't that good? Ecclesiastes 5, two. A verse that I must take to heart and I... Even, even in today's sermon, because I often struggle with this sin. In Ecclesiastes 5.2, this wisdom right before we pray, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. If that's wisdom, say amen with me. Amen. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.